I'm delighted to have a chance to talk to Lord Brown, who I first met when I was actually running the Lex column at the Financial Times, and I think I was one of those irritating journalists who had to call you up on results day and ask you what you were up to. Um, back then, you were a flag-waving champion for the fossil fuel sector, but you have since had a bit of a conversion. One might say a road to Damascus experience, which started actually 25 years ago with your first giant idea, which was when you went to Stanford and somewhat contrary to your image coming from the fossil fuel sector, you started talking about climate change. In fact, you were the first um, oil major CEO to actually talk about climate change. Tell us what you actually said 25 years ago and tell us just how unpopular it made you amongst your fellow CEOs in the energy sector. So uh, 20, 26 years ago, I think it right. was, I, I stood up at my alma mater, Stanford University, and I made a very simple statement that the oil and gas industry was the problem. It was causing climate change and it had to be part of the solution and that there were solutions. Uh, and that's what I said. And I not only actually said there should be solutions, I outlined the solutions to take, which uh, surprisingly for people contained both objectives and numbers. Numbers, things we actually had to achieve, uh, and I laid them out. So I did that uh, based on a lot of evidence, information that we'd looked at, uh, believing that there really was a problem which is building up very strongly, even at that time. Uh, after my speech, which was in May, I remember, uh, uh, there was a, a slight pause, very slight pause, uh, until the rest of the industry decided to start making statements. Some decided just to run for cover. Uh, the American Petroleum Institute, which uh, I've never had a very good relationship with, uh, is the lobby group for uh, oil. Uh, they said that I'd left the church. My answer to that was I didn't know I was a member of that church, uh, but I'd left the church, uh, and uh, it went on from there. I felt very confident that we'd done the right thing and we proceeded to do things because first we'd made sure that the company, the people in the company really wanted this to happen and they were aligned. Secondly, the board was aligned. And thirdly, because there was hope we were basically a technological company even in those days, we could read the data and see something that we saw that something had to be done. Right. Now, I think there's a delicious irony in you having done that in Stanford because I had lunch with Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, just last week during um, Unger Week. And at that, you know, he indicated that, of course, California is pressing ahead with a major lawsuit against the fossil fuel companies for, in the view of the Californian Attorney General, having covered up climate change for many years. Now, people like Chevron, who are based in California, are not exactly thrilled about the lawsuit. I'm sure they can't have been too thrilled with what you said all those years ago either. No, I mean, it was evident that, uh, you know, it was evident that on the balance of probabilities, and those probabilities have expanded over time, uh, that uh, an imbalance of CO2, an artificial imbalance induced by what humans did, was causing a different a change to the climate. So that was clear then. What became clearer over time was the probabilities attached to that. So better modelling, better information available, better observation, just improved uh, the certainty. Right. But it was clear then, and the minimum you could do was to take precautionary action. But we went beyond that. Uh, and, and I think the, the oil industry said, well, there's still a probability that it wasn't happening. Well, but there's always a probability that something's happening. But when you're at 50%, it seems to me you should sit and take note, it seems. Well, that's going to be very interesting to see what happens with the lawsuit because it really is very striking, this lawsuit, and one of many things that California is doing on that front right now. But um, do you think that the fossil fuel companies get it now? Because we had this extraordinary battle um, with Exxon. Chris James launched all that, um, and he managed to win a board or three board seats mm -hmm. and force them to change direction, um, it seems. 
But that was done through activism, not through any sudden conversion inside the C-suite. So when you look at the oil and gas sector today, do you think they get it? Well, I, I think it's worth remembering that the oil and gas sector is not actually all those names you know and remember, or perhaps even partly love or hate. Uh, they are companies like Saudi Aramco, uh, uh, Adlock, Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, Petronas, Petrobras. Uh, all these are state-owned companies, and they're the bulk of what goes on. So the question is, who gets what? I would say that the listed sector, under pressure, has got it, and they're doing something about it. They vary between we hate what we're doing to actually let's lean in and find a way of making a business of it. So they're in between. Uh, and the state oil companies are saying, well, we, we are producing oil and gas, and this is the basis of the economy in my country. And they're saying, we'll, we'll, we, we'll do the minimum here. We'll do the minimum and see what happens. So the answer is response is very varied, very varied indeed. Right. And there's a divide between Europe and uh, America, without any doubt. Right. Um, well, in terms of moral money, it's great news because everyone sitting in Europe is baffled by what the Americans are doing most of the time. Mm. And everyone in America is alarmed by what the Europeans exactly. are doing. And so both sides keep reading moral money to try and understand the other side. Um, <laughs> not least because you can't have a single strategy these days for West Virginia and California mm. and be consistent because they're taking sure. such radical approaches right now. Um, but coming back to the oil and gas sector, um, so during Unger Week, I had a party at my house in New York, and Al Gore came along and basically stood on my far pit and gave a speech to the crowd, which was electrifying, no pun intended, but basically argued that it is outrageous that the oil and gas companies are going to be so dominant at COP28, and the fact that the UAE is hosting it essentially, in Al Gore's view, means that the whole process has been captured. Um, you know, he's very, very strongly, along with many green activists, against the idea of the UAE having, you know, a hosting role, and even worse, having the head of the state oil company essentially chairing the COP28 yeah. process. What do you think? Is it good or bad? Is it better so, to have, you know, is this a case of, you know, game people turn poacher, or is it something that is... A sign of complete capture. Well, first of all, I, I you know, I, I deeply respect what Al has done over the, the history that I've been involved in in climate change. But I think in order to criticise, you have to have a productive answer uh, as an alternative. We are where we are. COP twenty, COP twenty eight is just another COP, uh, and COPs are needed because they are moments of diplomatic dialogue. You know, there, there needs to be a way of dialoguing. Uh, I, I think actually it's quite good that. Uh, uh, someone who wouldn't normally agree with you is part of the conversation rather than, you know, everyone agreeing with everybody is interesting, but it's not productive for future, uh, really driving a future uh, answer. So this is not bad. Uh, I think also that, uh, you know, we are at a point where uh, there are some things that can be done in COP which have real possibilities. Whether they happen, I don't know. For my taste, there are absolutely just three points. The first is we have to catalyze more finance uh, from people who normally finance activities who are not prepared to take the risk of default or low performance. So we need structures to encourage maybe 100 billion, 200 billion into the system to invest in uh, climate-friendly activities or carbon reduction activities. That's very important. Can I just stop you? Because I want to hear the, about the other yeah. two, but by that, do you basically mean blended finance? Of course. Using multilateral development bank money or philan private philanthropy money to wrap or de-risk so, projects by taking the first loss tranche in a capital structure. I, I'm not going to get a rat hole, but, but uh, I think actually... Well, it, actually, I think this group is no, very interesting. I, I'll give so, you, so I think this I is... I work for the FT, so I can geek out all day. You know? No, but it's not necessarily, Gillian, I think, a pure gift of... Uh, it's a conditional financing. So there's no reason why you can't have a, a, a security that actually provides loss protection at certain rates of return, but then recovers disproportionately at higher rates of return. Okay. So, you know, you don't, I don't think we have to go to pure condition, concessional finance. 
There'll be a mix of everything, of course okay. it will be. So de-risking projects de to some degree. De-risking is yeah. really, really important. Uh, uh, and it, it's not only for the finance, it sends a signal to people that this must be done. And that's important and probably will catalyze even more financing if we can get that right. The second is something needs to be done to rewire and sort out carbon credits and offsets. Mm -hmm. It's the Wild West out there. Uh, as you know, probably most of you will know, the voluntary market has basically seized up. It's stopped trading, uh, partly because there's nothing there where people can really grab hold of it and say, I know I can, as it were, bank this. This is really carbon reduction. That's important. And the third, I think, which is probably the most difficult to achieve is, is there an alliance between people who produce carbon that will get them to reduce carbon? Namely, the oil and gas companies, uh, <coughs> state producers, and so forth. So can they commit to zero methane emissions? I think that's the easiest thing, but it has to be policed. People have to watch what's happening. There are technologies to do that. I've invested in them. Uh, so I, I, won't, I won't promote them, but... No, no, but you, I'm going to let you promote them in a minute. Thank you very much, yes. I will. Uh, so, they, uh, <laughs> they, uh, so you can police this stuff. So that's methane, but carbon dioxide, the big challenge will be, I'm sure we could probably get people to move along scope one and scope two. Scope three is going to be difficult. I, I think, finally, if I may say, the, the big commitment has to be, in the end, to increase the ratio of clean to dirty energy. When you cut through all this work, in the end, you know, if it's one to one, it's no good. If it's five to one, we can get back on track to getting down to net zero. Whether we'll do that by 2050, in my mind, is deeply questionable at the moment. But that's the important bit. And the oil industry, to come back to what they need to do, the minimum they have to do is to invest in what you might call heavy iron, big capital, uh, that captures and stores carbon dioxide they produce. So carbon capture and storage, for example, is something that the oil and gas companies really could do uh, and must do. Well, they all want to talk about carbon capture these days. It's a bit like sort of buying indulgences in the medieval Catholic Church, you know. It, it um, does, doesn't cover everything, and I think it's... In, uh, I agree. Right. It doesn't cover everything, but there are some things where evidently it's clear you can do it. Yeah. You know? Well, listen, so just to quickly pick up on those three points, and I will come back in a moment and let you talk about all your brilliant technologies and stuff, and you can do your marketing pitch. Before that, though, methane, going to be a big theme of COP28. I suspect that's going to be where most of the tangible progress will come. I, I hope finance will be as or well. Or finance as I well. Gonna, well, I was going to come to that in a moment, really but methane good. will be a key part. Mm. On the issue of the carbon markets, I mean, by... A happy coincidence, I spent this morning writing a column which is going up in about an hour's time for the FT about a new initiative that the World Bank is launching with a so-called CEO council. This is a very radical departure for the World Bank. They've never had a CEO advisory council before and it's a sign they're desperately trying to pull all of you lot into the fold to get moving. And one of the things they're pitching to the group which probably will be picked up at COP28, is the idea of having the World Bank itself run carbon markets to create the credibility and the consistency and transparency. Is that a good idea? It's a good idea if it can actually be developed properly. I think there's another consortium of private banks mm -hmm. who will produce something I'm, I think everyone is trying to focus on. Can you do something which is SWIFT plus right. for carbon? Yes. And I think that actually is a very productive way of going forward. So if you can get some of the big, biggest banks in the world behind that, then that could be very exciting. And it could clear up this question of quality. Right. You know, someone quoted me when we, the big, the question is, what, what, what is there in these carbon credits? Mm -hmm. The worst thing is no one's sure. Exactly. No one's sure. They, they may be good, they may be bad. Maybe 30% will be good, 70% bad but no one's sure. So we need to get some certainty here. Right. Well, I think the idea is, you know, there's nothing like having a bit of competition around this um, yeah. to drive more innovation and accelerate the whole process. But I think that could certainly, either way, the carbon markets could be part of it. Um, and the other idea that they very much want to push, and I think the UAE is going to jump in with a pot of money to provide the tranche of capital to help de-risk these projects, is blended finance. Yes. 
Do you think we're, I mean, I've been writing, I've written endless columns about blended finance over the years. Um, as I say, we're pretty geeky at the FT, but thus far, it's not actually happened. Do you believe it's finally going to happen now? Um, well, I, I do, actually. I think it's worth another big push to see if we can get this done. I really do. I think, you know, people need to understand where it's going to go. There's a lot of muddle between uh, emerging markets and developed markets and what we mean by emerging markets. Where will this go? Uh, and indeed, finance for some emerging markets is quite readily available, uh, but it's not from all sources. So I, I think it's going to, I think we should push forward here. I really do. Right. Well, the great thing about the UAE hosting is it's one of the few hosts that actually has a big pot the of money. Whereby. It yeah. actually has a means to actually do something if it chooses. Yeah. And it would be ironic if the UAE ends up kickstarting blended finance projects for green energy. But looking at tech, you've got this net zero fund. You are investing in lots of different ways to try and decarbonize. What makes you most excited right now? Or are you basically going to be nice to everybody and say you love all the technologies? Well, of course, I love all the technologies. But uh, I think the ones which we're very excited about is very large systems that dramatically change either the way people work or reduce or increase their efficiency, whether that is the supply chain, uh, whether it's a management system for uh, energy generally, widely, how networks work. These things, I think, are very exciting. Uh, they, they will not solve the climate problem by themselves, but they will enable people to think about how they use existing infrastructure and can add to it incrementally. Now, we have to do some other things as well, where we have to take a bunch of capex and do very different things. But I think these two things can work in tandem quite well. And the important thing about doing things without the capex we need is at least it shows we're doing things on the run while we're getting that capex. We need to expand, as everyone knows here, uh, the investment level by a factor of probably three or four uh, to get to net zero in any reasonable time scale. And if you look ahead 25 years, you know, and try and imagine on the basis of what you see right now, what the energy mix will look like then, apart from, you know, we all love electrification, how do you see the energy mix? So I, th I think the sources of ele electrification will change. Uh, I think on the negative side, I think if anything ever happens to security, Someone like China will always have coal as a backup. That's what I think its purpose will be. But I think the mix will have many different things in. We'll certainly do more small-scale modular reactors. We'll do, uh, I, I do think, having been a physicist in my long past before I became an engineer, I've been very cynical about fusion. I'm less so now. I think there's much better ways of doing the experiments digitally rather than having to move big iron around to reassemble reactors. So I, I do actually think that we could get there. And I think there'll be a lot of other ways of creating uh, electric power. So I think that'll be very important. And I think we'll live in a very different way. 25 years time, the new housing stock should be very, very different indeed. The old housing stock will be the same. I think King's probably will be the same. It's been there for 600 years. Yeah. But we are, you know, said we put solar panels on the roof and we want to install heat pumps. So you know, nothing else that will have demonstration effect for historic buildings. Um, but um, in terms of SMRs, are you investing in them? No, not yet. Um, we're watching them very carefully. I think the, the interesting thing about all this equipment is if you keep buying things one off, they always stay the same price. If you bought six, they might get cheaper because you can have a program of development and installation. So can you invent the financing to get six people to buy SMRs in six different places and one program. Well, and that I think is an interesting, it can be done. Uh, just talking about Venice, incidentally, where I live part time, uh, uh, Venice created that system of uh, building to build ships. Uh, and that's how they got the mass production going. Everyone owned a different ship, but they all got worked on in one program. Right, well maybe we can ask the UAE to fund some mass purchases of SMRs. Well, they've already purchased larger 
nuclear reactors, of course. They have four reactors on stream, I think, at the moment, big ones. But I, I think, uh, so SMRs are something to be invested in in due course. Right, fantastic. Well, listen, thank you very much indeed. Um, as I say, what you said 25 years ago, 26 years ago, has truly proved to be prophetic, even if it didn't make you popular. Um, the fact you're now putting that into action is even more interesting. And I'll certainly be very interested to see what you do next over the next 26 years. So thank you. Thank you. Jill. Thank you very much. Thank you, John.